pray. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you that indeed you have sent your son Jesus the best gift to redeem us. So Father, we ask that you fill our hearts with your love, that we may surrender all, that you may take our lives and let us be holy thine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, our scripture reading this morning is taken from John chapter 6, verses 53 to 55. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. May God bless us. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath once again. Sabbath. Good. This morning we will first be celebrating our communion service and I thought uh, what better way than to reflect on the bread which comes from heaven that is found in Jesus. A story goes of a shah of a great monarch from Persia and he was well known as a champion of the people. He in order to relate to the needs and problems of the people he would often disguise himself and uh, he would mingle with them in various disguises. And so on one particular occasion, he went as a poor citizen uh, to the public bath. And there in his tiny cellar, he sat down beside the person, who, the man who tended the furnace. And as there, he was talking to the lonely man and at dinner time, he would often spend time together with him. Ate some of his plain food, uh, in great contrast with what he ate in the palace, and continued. And so in the weeks that followed, he continued to visit him regularly and over time his heart grew uh, more fond of the poor man right there. As he grew to love, love him dearly, one day he revealed himself to the man and told him of who he was. And he was expecting to hear a request from the man of some expensive gift or something that he could give to him. But there the man sat in silence. And after a while, he spoke as he gazed in him in astonishment. And he said, you left your palace to sit with me here in this dark place to eat my coarse bread and to care whether my heart is glad or sad. You may give rich presents to others, but you have given of yourself to me. Please, your majesty, never redraw your gift of friendship. Isn't it amazing? We do have Jesus also, likewise, if we look at the parallel, right? The one, the bread from heaven, he came all the way from his heavenly courts, right? To be with each one of us. He offered to us the same precious gift of friendship. What is our response for that gift of friendship in which he offers us. This morning, as we look into uh, John chapter 6, uh, it highlights in first in John chapter 6, if we give a bit of background, it is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And in the feeding of 5,000 here, uh, is, we know, a parable or rather a miracle that is repeated in all four Gospels. And that highlights its importance. Only the feeding of 5,000 as well as the death and resurrection of Jesus that is repeated in all four Gospels. So in context of after the people had been fed, the 5,000 had been fed, they went looking for Jesus. And he had sailed across the lake in a boat, their needs were met, and now they were finding where did Jesus go? Right? And they found that his boat was still there, and they went and found him at Capernaum. There, as they wanted to find him, 
they started have to have different questions for him. They wanted to find him for their own reasons, we will shortly see. First, of course, Jesus presented himself later as the bread from heaven, but that was not what they had come to receive yet. Here, if we look at the first, there are different, I call the Q&A with the Jews, uh, because they have their own questions, Jesus has his answers. Uh, there is a saying uh, in nowadays in modern times that if you ask the question, why five times, you will get to the root of the answer. I'm not very sure whether they asked why five times, but in a sense they did. And so let's take a look uh, this morning together. Here, first, when they found Jesus there, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? So first they asked a very general question. You know, they are like asking him, Oh, Jesus, we've been looking for you. Where have you been? You know, in that sense. And Jesus he knew their hearts and so he answered, I assure you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Now in John, signs were often the different stories, the different miracles, everything that was written in John are different signs that point to Jesus, that point to his spiritual authority, that point to spiritual realities that Jesus wanted them to. But however, the people were often thinking on a more material level, their physical needs were met. They thought of their feeding of 5,000, they thought of their recent uh, bread that they eaten that was for free that they didn't have to buy and they were thinking, ah, when can we eat this bread again from Jesus? And so Jesus would say, don't work for food which perishes but the food that lasts for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval in him. So God, Jesus is telling them here, don't look just for the physical bread that you have, I have given you to eat but look for spiritual bread that will fill you that God approves of, that will last for eternal life, that will last forever. So Jesus is trying to direct them. They're always thinking of a temporal Messiah, want to free them from the Romans, the physical realities, the bread that they can eat. Jesus is saying, look beyond material things. Look at spiritual things. Look for not just the bread which you eat, but the bread that will fill you forever. But they didn't quite get it yet. And so they just wanted their bread. And so they asked, so what can we do to perform the works of God? You know, they asked, we just want their bread. We just want to also have the same miracles. We are not really interested, you know, in what's this bread from heaven. We just want to perform the works of God. Could we sometimes also be the same, you know? We look for God, not for the spiritual things that he gives us. But perhaps at times like the Jews who ask, we might be looking for God to fulfill our different checkbox that we have presenting to him, the different needs, material things we want. Not that it's bad, but when we exclude the spiritual things and forget to place that in importance, that's what Jesus wants to lead them to and also lead us to. And so Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. They wanted to have the power of God, right, to perform the miracles. But Jesus is saying, that's not what you need. What you need is to believe in Him. God's work is not that you need to fill yourselves with, by performing miracles, in this case with bread, but in this case, that to believe in Him is the work that God has called them and called us likewise to do. And that is what in question and answer, uh, the part two. There they, they realized that God, Jesus, was calling them to something else. The question that they asked was, what must we do? And that's in uh, part two. They missed that the point of receiving it was in not what they needed to do, right? They were thinking we need to perform the works of God, we need to do some pious works, we need to fulfill certain conditions, then we can now perform the works of God that we want to do. But Jesus is saying that is not what you need to do, right? Because in those times, they always had many lists of long requirements on what they wanted to do. We know that the Pharisees had exacted, I believe, um, I can't remember the exact number, 513 or 613, of extra different requirements on top of the laws that they have. And so they were all about different doing and doing. And not that doing is bad, but they were thinking of doing in order to receive something rather than being with God. And so Jesus is telling them, your role is not to do, but to believe. And that is what he was telling them in receiving the bread of life. It is not about what works we can perform, 
but is how can we choose to believe in Jesus, that bread from heaven? They were not yet satisfied. So they say, okay, you say you want to believe. So what can you do to prove that we can believe in you, right? What sign will you perform for us that we can believe in you? And they had already, remember, just seen the sign very recently of the feeding of the multiplication of the loaves of the phylos and two fishes. They had already seen what they needed to believe in God. But here they were asking yet for another sign. And they tried to quote uh, Moses and said, Our fathers ate in the wilderness just as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They were trying to use Moses' name as their favorite uh, card, always Moses, then oh, this is the right answer, and then try to counter everyone. Right? But there they tried to say it was as if it was Moses who gave manna from heaven. But Jesus here wanted to correct them. That it was not Moses who provided the manna from heaven, but it was God who provided that manna from heaven. I think here sometimes we ask ourselves is how many times could we sometimes look at the messenger that God has sent and say, ah, oh, thank you so much. But could we sometimes also forget to thank the giver that is found in God that has given us all good things? Sometimes in reality, in human life, it's very easy to look what is before us, but forgetting that Jesus or God is the one who is the real provider of all these things. Jesus said to them, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. There was a tradition in the Jewish times that they believed that just as uh, there was a manna for 40 years when they were in the wilderness, when the Messiah comes, they believe that during Passover, he would have manna called down from heaven, signifying that he was the Messiah. And while Jesus did not do that exactly in a physical sense, they had a different kind of manna that fell from heaven. There was the feeding of 5,000, there was the multiplication of the phylos and two fishes. But more importantly, they had the manna that fell from heaven that was not physical, but spiritual. That Jesus was the bread from heaven, the manna, the bread from heaven that came to earth to fulfill their spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst that they will not need to thirst again. And that is where we will come to the part four where Jesus said, and then their, their next question is, so, okay, Jesus, give us this bread always. We want to never thirst and never hunger. And they were still talking at the physical material way of things where Jesus is keep trying to bring them up to spiritual things. So you can start to see that slowly you will see the drift and differences between their question and his answer. And it looks a little and a little more ridiculous slowly because they keep insisting to view things physically, whereas Jesus keeps trying to bring it to a spiritual way of viewing things. We will take a look shortly. Jesus answered, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will never ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. They had seen the signs of Jesus multiplying the phylos and two fishes. They do not believe. They had seen him heal. They had seen him preach. They had seen him teach. They still did not believe. And here, as he said, everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none that he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Jesus here was offering to them the promise of eternal life, the promise that He would come again and give them resurrection, and they would be filled. He was giving them promise that they would never hunger and never thirst. Just as they had received manna day by day, here, Jesus was saying that he himself was the bread from heaven that will fill their spiritual hunger, spiritual nourishment. And often uh, in the Jewish times, they look at these things as comparison to God in the sense of the idea of wisdom. And the idea of divine wisdom was something that they portrayed closely towards God. 
And Jesus was saying, basically, that he is that divine wisdom that they are looking for, that bread from heaven, the one that will help them to never thirst or hunger yet again. And so the Jews complain because now he starts to claim that he is similar to God. And this expression, I am, has different, uh, three basically different uh, meanings. One, the I am could be literal, like it is I. When Jesus was walking on the water towards the disciples on the boat in John 6, he says, it is I, and that is I am. But I am also can mean where Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. So Jesus used I am in that context of he is divine, but I am in terms of the different attributes that he, Jesus is. And of course, we have the I am that I am that God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, the sign of divinity. And Jesus here talking about that he is, that he is the light bread from heaven, and now they understood he is trying to claim that he is divine. And they couldn't believe it because they had seen this person growing up, the son of Joseph growing up. They say, how can he say he come down from heaven? We know his parents, Joseph and Mary. He grew up here. How could it be? The question we ask ourselves is, sometimes when God works in ways that we look at it is very ordinary, we may also ask, right, how can it be? Right? We know this person. We know how things work. Do we sometimes also ask God, I don't think this is the way you work, Lord. Do we sometimes limit the way in which we view that we can receive God's workings in our lives? And Jesus answered to them, stop complaining among yourselves. And I think this is something interesting and a good parallel as well. Because when the Israelites received manna or the bread from heaven, in the wilderness, after eating, they also complained, right? Literally bread from heaven, literally food from heaven. I wonder today if we or if I were to receive manna from heaven, would we complain? Maybe we enjoy it for the first few weeks and first few months, but after a few years, we say, ah, God, boring, ah, every time the same food. Would that be our response, right? That is an interesting thought to have. But likewise, not only for the physical bread from heaven, the manna, spiritual bread from heaven as well, right? When they receive Jesus, they likewise also complain. I thought that's very interesting, right? And I think uh, as Singaporeans, we are no strangers to complaining. But this is an interesting thought that Jesus reminds them to stop complaining. Stop complaining of the good things that God has given to them. He continues and says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God, and everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. So he's reminding them to receive the bread from heaven. First is to believe in him. Second, reminder, come to him. It's the same thing, basically repeated in different ways. And not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is sent, who is from God. He has seen the Father. So basically only Jesus has seen God. And uh, sometimes in different parts, of course, they say, show me the Father. That's what Philip said to Jesus. And Jesus says, you have seen him, which is in Jesus. There is a revelation here, and we look at it that Jesus here, he calls himself indeed the bread of life. That bread of life is something that we have allusion to, right? We have the allusion that is found in our Lord's Supper, we will see uh, later too. And that bread is the one that is a living bread, something that gives life. He says, anyone who has bread believes has eternal life, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. And this is the bread that comes from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I will give for the life of the world who is my flesh. Jesus is now explaining that this bread is a living bread. That is his life that he has to give of himself. That is his sacrifice that he has to sacrifice. It is not just something convenient like in the manner they receive from heaven where there may not be an apparent sacrifice on Jesus' part. But here, he will have to give of his life, of his flesh. He has to die. He has to pay a sacrifice in order that they may receive this bread from heaven and life. Jesus has to take a sacrifice. 
Jesus, as the bread from heaven, offers each one to eat of it that day that we may live forever. And here is where the things start to get a little more ridiculous because as much as they look at it, it is impossible to see that it is, can be physical, it has to be spiritual. It's just the same questions as Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can I be born again? How can I go inside my mother's womb and be born again? Right? All these are literal impossibilities. Right? And that is what, basically what they are doing because they keep refusing and keep trying to force it to see at a physical level. That's why the questions sound more and more strange because they refuse to accept Jesus' explanation or maybe they don't want to or things like that because they did not want to accept that he was the Messiah because they knew his parents. So likewise, they ask a question that doesn't make sense, right, slowly. They say, how can he give us flesh to eat? How can we eat his literal flesh? How can we be cannibalism? You know, they're saying, why can we do such a thing? That is the kind of question they start to ask, even though Jesus had been pointing to them there. And Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Do you know where this phrase is familiar in? Anyone? Unless you eat the flesh and drink his blood. Anyone has an idea where this comes from? Well, to ring the bell for us, it is in the Lord's Supper, the communion, which we often read in 1 Corinthians right, 15 later, right? unless we eat of Jesus' blood and drink, uh, eat his flesh and drink his blood, there is no life in him. Then we will be reading that later on. And this, there is a parallel here because the Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus. And Jesus here was trying to point them to the, both the Passover and then, of course, the Passover lamb, which he is, and then the Lord's Supper in remembering his death later on. But we know that even the Passover lamb, when eating of it, they cannot drink his blood. So it means that Jesus cannot be talking about drinking his blood because they knew from the Passover lamb that they do not drink the blood of the Passover lamb. Right? You know, Jewish prepare their food very specially, kosher, no blood in it. And so they knew that too, that the Passover lamb, which pointed to the Messiah, would not have blood in it. And therefore, it could not be that Jesus was asking them to drink his literal blood and his literal flesh because that was not what they studied in the Passover and that's not what they knew that God had been calling them to do. And he said, anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is real fruit and my blood is real drink. Those, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the manna your fathers ate and died, the one who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus calls them that they are called not just, not just to be believed, but the act of believing is a continual verb, it's a continual action. It is a not one time of belief and that's finished. But the continual action of believing is a continual action of receiving. And just as we need to eat every day, if we don't like the word bread, we can use the word food, the same idea. The bread or the food itself is something we need to eat every day. And that food or bread nourishes us. And we may not always remember what we have eaten, right? One month ago, one week ago. But the point is that bread nourishes us. And likewise, when it comes to spiritual things, we may not always remember every single sermon we heard, every single lesson study we read, but when we have done so, that spiritual bread and spiritual food, it also likewise nourishes us and gives us the strength. And I like one of the uh, quote this morning that our, one of the sisters mentioned, that it's so important indeed to study God's word for ourselves because that is truly the bread from heaven, Jesus, which he offers to us. So what are the different responses, right? First, Jesus has already answered their questions uh, five, six times. There is uh, the answer for there. First, they want to know where is he. They want to receive the bread. And he says, 
I know you just want to see the bread. And they say, okay, how can we work the miracles likewise? And he says, no, the, the works is not to work miracles, but to believe. And then they say, okay, we want this bread, give us to eat. And Jesus says, I am that bread right, of life that you need to receive. But they did not want to receive. They say, huh? you are the bread from heaven, cannot be. You know, we know your parents. But then Jesus continues to tell them to receive and to believe in him. So after doing so, they, they start to say it is impossible, right? When Jesus says that to eat his flesh and drink his blood, then they say, uh, what, cannibalism? And so we see that the, the differentiation going further and further because they refuse to accept that simple truth that laid before them. They try to make it sound more and more ridiculous and then say, oh, we cannot believe in these things because Jesus said eat his flesh and drink his blood. But if they will not accept the literal thing which he says, believe in me, then they say, cannot believe, right? You are our parents, we know them, cannot be. Then he say, okay, now you accept the bread from heaven because uh, the manna which have eaten, the forefathers have eaten. And this is an interesting thought. How many times also we may not accept uh, the easy answer that's before us? Then we tell God, we reason with him and tell him, no, no, cannot be. And then we, we come out more and more strange arguments to him and try to defend our position and say, God, no, it cannot be this way. Lord, I don't have time now. Lord, this is not what I understand you to be. I can only accept your answered prayer within my expectations. That sometimes could be what we sometimes might do. But what are the different responses from the various people? The first response was, it was a very hard teaching. Who can accept it? The disciples say, oh, Lord, why you make your things so hard? But it was also said those times in the times of the rabbis, sometimes they make their teachings a bit difficult. They wanted to weed out the true followers and the not true followers. But here, Jesus was asking them, does this offend you? He asked that question. They feel that, what is Jesus talking, right? Eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they were starting to have doubts in their heart. But Jesus here clarifies and he says it's the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that are spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. So it's important here, Jesus makes a very clear clarification for them. It is not the physical eating and drinking of his blood, but it is the words he has spoken. Of course, the words he has spoken to them at that time, but today we have the Bible, which is God's word, and the bread of heaven, which he has given to us. And he's talking about the different spirit, the attitude of the heart and mind, which there is reaching out to them. Here, there are different responses that we have. We have the disciples who says, where shall we go? We have others, many others, who no longer accompany Jesus. They left because they felt it was too difficult. And we have Judas who remained by his side, there and he wasn't he pretend to continue to be followed and saved but actually in his heart he did not but peter's answer was you have the words of eternal life that was his response his response was that jesus was the true bread from heaven and he accepted him but we ask ourselves today likewise what is our response to jesus are we like Peter and the disciples who say, yes, Lord, I believe in you because you have the words of eternal life. Or perhaps we could be like Judas who say, yeah, I reject you, but you continue to be there and pretend that you are safe following Jesus. Or perhaps we could be like the different, uh, many crowds and many of the disciples who reject Jesus openly and left him. What is our response today when Jesus sometimes asks us to do things that we think are strange things are impossible, like in their sense, eating his flesh and drinking his blood, but perhaps for us in a different way, some other things that God calls us to do that it seems strange or seems impossible for us. The question we ask ourselves is that truly Jesus is the breath of life, and if our response is to receive him, that is first to believe in him, to read his word, to allow his word to change us in our character, to allow his love to fill our hearts. And in doing so, that is how we receive the bread from heaven. Here in Desire of Ages, page 391, it says, the Holy Spirit comes to the soul as a comforter. By the transforming agency of his grace, the image of God is reproduced in the disciple. He becomes a new creature, 
love takes the place of hatred, and the heart receives the divine similitude. This is what it means to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is eating the bread that comes from heaven. Eating the bread that comes from heaven means that we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, to transform us, to become more like Jesus in terms of character, to receive his words, to read the Bible, and they, bit by bit, our love, his God's love will fill our hearts and replace the different negative things that we have in our hearts. And so the question we ask ourselves later as we partake of the bread and wine, as we eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus, of course in the spiritual sense and the symbol, is, Lord, are we willing to do things that sometimes we may not be comfortable to do? Are we willing to accept truths that are sometimes hard to do? Are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, to transform us, our character, to become more like Him? Sometimes it may be a hard saying, but what is our response to Jesus? What is our response to the bread from heaven that He gives us today? Do we, like the Israelites, sometimes say, ah, the manna, every day eat already, 30, 40 years, tired of it, right? Complaining. Or do we respond and say, Lord, this is a precious bread from heaven and I want more and more of it. I want you to change my character to become more like you each day. What is our response this morning? As we contemplate on that, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the bread of heaven which you give Jesus offered so freely to each of us. So as we accept that gift you give to us, help us, Father, to also accept the difficult things, questions that sometimes you ask of us, the difficult calling that sometimes you ask of us, and also the response that we may have to allow you to transform us. Too. We ask as we receive the bread from heaven that you may transform us day by day to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, as we have partake the bread from heaven, as we partake of this bread and wine, Lord, we call on you to help us as we surrender all, our strong deliverer, that we may praise you and allow us to become more and more like you each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.